Hi, my name is Shibashi Chatterjee from the Baylor College of Medicine, and along with my colleagues, Dr. Hong and Dr. Maluski, today we'll talk about perioperative care of the aortic surgical patient, focusing on thoracoabdominal aortic surgery. This builds on the extensive experience of Dr. Joseph Caselli at the Baylor College of Medicine over the last three decades. So to begin with, after surgery, I want to discuss what the fundamentals are that any clinician at the bedside in the ICU want, will want to know at the time of handoff. The first thing is the extent of repair. And so here is the Crawford classification based on the extent of repair. And knowing the specific details, for example, extent one and extent two aneurysms are more likely to have vocal cord dysfunction. Extent twos and threes are more likely to have paraplegia is important to be able to anticipate what the complications might be. You wanna know what the cardiopulmonary tolerance were. How did the heart react? How did the lungs react? And how well did they tolerate surgery? You wanna know what the planned procedures were, but especially what the unplanned procedures were. Was there leg ischemia? Was there some sort of more extensive uh, mesenteric revascularization required? Was there a splenectomy that was necessary during the course of the dissection? So that's always important. You wanna know what the management of the renal and mesenteric vessels were. The more extensive endarterectomy and more extensive procedures that were done creates a little bit higher risk of a patient, and those patients tend to benefit from a higher mean arterial pressure. You want to know what the distal vascular exam was, and you really want to know what the extent of bleeding was at the end of the case. So literally every organ system in the body is vulnerable during the course of thoracoabdominal aneurysm repair. So neurologically, stroke and delirium, encephalopathy and even coma are all risks that are all uh, potential complications that could arise. The, the signature complication of thoracoabdominal repair is spinal cord ischemia, whether in the form of paraparesis where, with sensory deficits or paraplegia with motor deficits. In addition, cerebrospinal fluid drain complications can arise and even minor complications such as spinal headache can be uh, attributed to the procedure. Next, from a pulmonary standpoint, patients are at risk of reintubation and atelectasis and pneumonia, even developing respiratory failure. Specific cases because of the vulnerability of the recurrent laryngeal nerve can even result in vocal cord movement impairment and that's a potential risk. In addition, arrhythmias, myocardial infarction and pericardial effusions can develop and you need to be vigilant to watch for them. Mesenteric ischemia, shock liver, bowel obstruction can all be uh, potentially uh, a result of the repair. And finally, acute kidney injury and lower extremity ischemia are all things that we need to be vigilant about in the perioperative period. We keep emphasizing that the three most important perioperative goals are spinal cord, spinal cord, spinal cord. And this should guide all management. So for example, any clinical decision-making sedation, diuresis, uh, uh, arrhythmia management, always should keep in mind what can make the spinal cord more vulnerable to ischemic injury and thus management should be modified accordingly. So the critical component to remember is the concept of spinal cord perfusion pressure based upon a similar entity with cerebral perfusion pressure. This is the mean arterial pressure minus the cerebrospinal fluid pressure. So typically our goals are a map of 80 to 100, preferably in the 90 to 100 range, a cerebrospinal fluid pressure of somewhere between 10 to 15, and that results in a spinal cord perfusion pressure goal of at least greater than 60. And this illustrates that really as long as we maintain a spinal cord perfusion, a spinal cord perfusion pressure goal of about 60, we should be at lower risk of spinal cord complications subsequently. Now, we have developed a concept called the rule of tens, which is sort of a rough guide with respect to being able to resuscitate. So from a volume resuscitation standpoint, aiming for a CVP somewhere in the, the 10 range. And, you know, and while some people might not necessarily use CVP for resuscitation, whether it's in the form of point of care echo or other uh, PA diastolic pressures in the 14 range, it's important to keep in mind adequate volume resuscitation. Next is a mean arterial pressure close to 100. Uh, we aim for at least in the high 90s if possible. A hemoglobin uh, postoperatively in the 10 range is, is, 
is what we target again to be able to maximize oxygen delivery to the spinal cord. And accordingly, a CSF drain pressure is somewhere between 10 to 15. So here you can see multiple combinations of 10 that add up to 100. It's something that junior level trainees can easily remember as a guide. It's something that we try to emphasize to nurses and our trainees and APCs that this is something every time you see a patient, you should try to make sure that the patient is following the rule of 10s. Now, with respect to CSF drain management, we get a lot of questions on how we manage it and whatnot. So the important thing is, what is our CSF goal? We typically aim for somewhere in the 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury at first. The, typically, once the patient has a more reliable exam, we feel a little bit better about inching up on the higher end of this. And that's because at the end of the day, the clinical exam is the single most important thing. But until we know that, we aim for somewhere between 10 to 15. We try to avoid draining more than 10 cc's an hour or 25 cc's in four hour and, and no more than about 150 cc's in 24 hours. And this is really to avoid the risk of herniation and subdural hematomas. If we encounter delayed paraplegia, we might increase this just a little bit, but we try to, again, be very cautious and very vigilant of this. The worst kind of thing to happen with a delayed paraplegia case is to complicate that with the subdural on top of it. Next is, there is, we tend to keep patients in bed rest when they have a CSF drain. There are other institutions that will let patients get up into a chair. Uh, again, this is variable. And finally, we will typically clamp the drain for somewhere between six to 12 hours, uh, sometimes overnight, and then typically remove it somewhere between 48 to 72 hours, uh, depending on their clinical exam. Now, this is an algorithm about how we manage delayed uh, spinal cord uh, ischemia or delayed paraplegia. This is when a patient wakes up, they're moving their legs, and sometime in the perioperative per period, they no longer move their legs. This can happen um, hours after surgery, days after surgery. It's even been reported in the four to six week period. In our experience, about 85 to 90% of cases happen in the first five days. So typically during the course of the ICU stay. So if we were notified and we confirm that there's sp spinal cord deficit and delayed paraplegia, the first thing we do is we make sure the mean arterial pressure is at least 90 to 100 before we go further beyond. There's a good study that showed when delayed paraplegia occurs, it occurs with MAPS in the 70s. When it's rescued, it's with MAPS in the 90s. The next we ask ourselves is a CSF drain in place. If a drain is in place, we will drain it down to 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury and drains nowhere between, somewhere between 10 to 15 an hour. Slowly, we'll try to increase the target map between 100 to 115, and we'll make sure that there's adequate volume resuscitation. If there is not an adequate drain in place, we place a stat, doesn't matter day or night, call to the CV anesthesiologist for a uh, CSF drain to be placed immediately, and then we follow a similar guide in terms of drainage. While we are doing those things, we'll also administer dexamethasone and mannitol for about 48 hours uh, to try to reduce uh, CSF pressure and uh, benefit that way. Now, this is the critical elements. We typically see improvement within about six to 12 hours. If we don't see improvement in the first couple hours, we will typically add a single dose of lidocaine, 100 milligrams IV over an hour or so, and then we will add four grams of magnesium sulfate. This is probably a little bit less evidence-based, but this is just over time. At this point, we're trying to do everything we can to try to potentially benefit the patient. So this is our protocol in terms of uh, how to res rescue patients after delayed paraplegia. Now, hypotension can help. Hypotension in the perioperative period is more important because Unlike a MAP target of 65, we really don't want to uh, tolerate a MAP less than 85. The first thing we do is we rapidly assess it and we fix it as quickly as possible. It's important to keep in mind a differential diagnosis of all the things that can go wrong. There could be hypovolemia, which is fixed with volume resuscitation. There could be hemorrhage, which is fixed with transfusion. And if it, ongoing reoperation is needed, there could be a low cardiac output. And this is treated with inotropes and even echocardiography and if the cardiac cath lab is necessary based on uh, uh, laboratory values, that's necessary. There could be vasodilatory shock, which we treat with pressors and steroids. And there could be dysrhythmias. We treat aggressively with amiodarone, 
and even cardioversion if necessary, or there can be a combination of things. And it's important to keep in mind, just because one of these etiologists was prominent early in the course, as the perioperative course progresses, other things could come into the forefront. So with respect to volume and renal management, we typically begin with crystalloid fluids, one to one and a half to two cc's per kilo per hour. Um, we guide our resuscitation with favoring CVP, a PA diastolic target, adequate cardiac output. Often patients will get mannitol in the operating room, so watch out for excessive urine output. It's not uncommon for patients to have four, five, six hundred cc's an hour for the first couple hours, so you have to keep up with them. Patients with chronic kidney disease, we will place in the operating room a temporary femoral dialysis line. In case dialysis becomes necessary in the very early perioperative period, it's important to, um, for multidisciplinary rounding to adjust perioperative antibiotics and do other preventive measures to reduce the risk of acute kidney injury. Be cautious with Ketorolac and don't be surprised with the significant positive fluid balance in the uh, first 24 hours. We are in general very cautious with diuretics. We try to avoid hypotension. When we do need to use diuretics as becomes necessary, we start with a small bolus and then begin with the low dose Lasix infusion and we titrate accordingly. And um, with respect to contrast imaging for surveillance, we try to get the creatinine back to baseline before we get there. And again, with all of these things, in, it's always important to remember spinal cord, spinal cord, spinal cord uh, to help guide the perioperative management. So in summary, we aim for a mean arterial pressure somewhere in the 80 to 100 range, CSF pressure somewhere between 10 to 15. Remember the rule of tens. Delayed paraplegia, the critical things, get a CSF train in, get the map close to 100. Manitol and Decadron, think about some other things if needed. And whenever you encounter hypotension, don't just treat it blindly with volume or pressors. Think about, is there another cause or etiology that needs to be treated? We also had an opportunity recently published in the JTCVS, some recent, uh, some other uh, delineating our, our algorithm uh, and expounding on these in more detail. And with that, I appreciate your attention to join us in this series. Thank you.